also thank you for the conference organizer for providing this opportunity to be able to present you some of the research that uh, our group has done for the past several years. So this talk is going to be about data-driven computational for our student system. The focus is on two things. One is computational open control, one is uncertainty. So first, let's take a look at a standard open control problem, not linear open control problem. So what I presented here is a generic problem formulation for a non-linear constrained open control problem. So in open control problem, what we want is to identify or to find this state x and control u satisfy some constraint. The first constraint is dynamic system, and some the second constraint is some boundary conditions, and the last constraint is a constraint on the trajectory x and control u. Now, I want to identify this x and u to satisfy this constraint at the same time, minimize or optimize some performance metric. Now, what is this performance metric? Typically, we got a performance metric in this fashion. Now, this cost function includes two parts. The first part is called event cost of, or endpoint cost. It's a cost associated to initial condition or final condition of the state variable. And the second part is called running cost. It's basically the cost associated to the whole trajectory over the time horizon. Now, this is a standard open control problem. Now, for this standard open control problem, you can use it to model actually many, many different control applications. Uh, for instance, if you consider, say, a uh, motion planning problem, motion planning problem for autonomous vehicle or for some aerospace applications, now, your vehicle dynamics is basically given by this dynamic system, that this dynamic constraint. Now, in this motion planning, you always have some initial condition and final condition. The initial condition can represent which are initial position of your car and you drive your car to some target location. So those things become your boundary condition. Then you can basically group them into this constraint. And also, for any control application, you always have some other type of constraint. For instance, if you consider a power vehicle, you're going to have some constraint on the velocity, on the turning rate, those things. Those are control constraints. And also, you, want, you probably don't want the trajectory to hit some obstacle. So this type of constraint can all group into what we call pass constraint. Now, when you design a, a open control, when we design control signal, you also want to typically you want to also want to optimize some performance. Now, what kind of performance? Well, you probably want to optimize your transfer time or fuel consumption. Now, those performance metrics can basically be modeled in this fashion. So, in this way, you can basically uh, model mathematically model many control uh, problem into this type of constraint optimization problem. Now, for a constraint non-linear uh, awesome control problem, we call of this non uh, linear We have to solve that those have a problem numerically. Except for some very trivial case, you can get analytic solution. In most cases, you will have to use numerical method to solve the kind of problem that has awesome control. And over the past several decades, as it started from uh, early 1990s, well, many people have invested time to develop efficient computational control software and algorithms. So nowadays, we have actually very efficient computational algorithms that you can use to solve this type of nonlinear and constrained algorithms. Even for the case where you have very complicated nonlinear dynamics or complicated algorithms, you can still use some well-designed numeric software or numeric algorithm to solve this. So this is not as fancy here. This is a standard non-linear control problem. As I said, there are many well-designed algorithms we can use to solve this problem. So once you solve that open control, you only have a control application. You first model it as open control problem. Then you use numeric method to generate the open control. Now once you fit your open control into a dynamic system, you're going to generate a state trajectory. Let's say for the motion planning case, the state trajectory will basically goes from your starting location to some target location. Now, however, when you really implement your control into a real physical system, this is typically what happens. The system trajectory, the real trajectory, which is this red line here, typically will be different to the trajectory, optimal trajectory that you plan. So this blue line here is optimal trajectory that you computed. So 
But this red line here, uh, typically the real system trajectory. Once you fit your computer open control in your fitting. Now, why is there some difference between the planned trajectory and optimal trajectory? Well, as a control engineer, the answer is actually very simple. It's nothing but effect of uncertainty. Now, in any fitting system, any control system, there are a lot of sources for uncertainty. You can have unmodeled uh, dynamics, you can have unknown parameters in your, in your mathematic model, and you can have measurement noise, sensor noise, and you can have some external disturbance. All those uncertainty were basically all those, all those uncertainty that you have to be explicit model in your mathematic problem formulation, they will basically cause this dis uh, deviation. Deviation of the real trajectory from the planned trajectory. Okay. So now from a control perspective, how to mitigate this uncertainty? If, since we know that in any control system, uncertainty is ubiquitous. You will always have uncertainty involved. Now how to mitigate the effect of uncertainty? From a control perspective, well, the standard answer is to use feedback. So, the feedback basically means that at any time moments you're going to measure a state variable, and as your state changes, deviate from your planned uh, trajectory, then you're going to generate a new control signal. So your control signal will be based on the current state variable. So this is feedback. Now this feedback we kind of will basically provide uh, some robustness to uh, uh, do some small disturbances and do some uncertainty. Now, within optimal control framework, how to generate feedback and optimal solution? There are two standard approach. The first one is by solving this classical IGB equation, time principle variable equation. Now, what's the IGB equation? It's basically a partial differential equation with respect to this so-called value function or cost to government. And it has these boundary uh, final conditions. Now, once you solve this, suppose that you can solve this uh, IGB equation, you are going to get this uh, value function V. Now, once you have value function V, your control is given by this formula. Now, the case about this formula is that the control is basically given as a function of both time and x. So, in other words, you're going to get a feedback control. And this feedback control is optimal. So, basically, by solving this partial differential equation, IGB equation, you, you're going to get optimal solution for all possible initial conditions. So, therefore, you get your, your solution, the optimal control, is actually a feedback solution. So, of course, well, if I can solve this IGB, I call feedback solution, well, that's a perfect situation. So in that case, as a control engineer, we always want to apply feedback solution, right? So once you got this feedback control, you can insert it to here. That's my feedback and optimal control. However, solving IGB equation is notoriously difficult, and most because of this curse of dimensionality. So this curse of dimensionality actually refers to dimension of this state variable x. Now, because this is PDE, well, if you're, uh, and it's nonlinear, you have to solve it, you, you need some numeric method. You need to discretize your value function. And now, this value function is high dimensional function. High dimensional, and uh, dimension depends on the dimension of the state trajectory, uh, of the state variable x. So, therefore, if you have a high dimensional problem, okay. the computational effort involved in order to solve this IGB is very, very uh, uh, huge. Okay. And actually, now, uh, one of the active research target in applied mathematics is to develop more efficient numeric method to solve high-dimensional IGB equations. Now, this is one of approach to generate feedback control so that I can mitigate some uncertainty in my control system. Another approach is also very popular. It's called real-time open control. Real-time computational open control. Another, name, another very popular name is model predictive control. So the, the key idea here is that, here is that it, the key idea is actually very simple. You want to generate an open control instead of solving that IJB equation. Now what I can do is I can try to compute an open loop solution, but I'm going to compute it in a real time, in an online fashion. So every time moment, if this x changes, then I'm going to compute a new, I'm going to generate a new open control uh, in real time. Now if you can generate, if you can finish this computation in real time, you better generate a closed loop feedback control. Although at every time instance, when you try to solve that open control problem, you actually got an uh, open loop control. But because you generate this open loop control at a very fast rate, the moment this x change, you can generate a new open loop control. So overall, this structure will provide you a feedback control. So this is the essential idea of uh, model per day control. And if I find this, will require a very efficient computational open control algorithm. You need a very efficient numerical tool to be able to solve that open control problem in online fashion. 
So those are two typical ways to handle or to mitigate uncertainty. But in these two approaches to mitigate uncertainty, you basically rely on this feedback mechanism. But when you design open control part, when the design of open control itself, you don't really consider uncertainty. You just pretend that your system has no uncertainty, then you try to design open control. And you implement that open control in this feedback function so that I can have some robustness into my closed system. So this kind of standard approach, you know, handles uh, or mitigates some uncertainty in an open control framework. Now over the past few years, we try to uh, develop a little bit different approach. We try to mitigate the effect of uncertainty not through feedback, not indirectly through feedback, but instead through open loop or open control. In other words, when I design my open control problem, when I design my open control, I will make sure that that open control <coughs> is robust to uncertainty. Okay. Now, the first question comes to your mind, at least that's the first question that comes to my mind, is that is this even possible? Is it even possible to have an open loop control but still robust with respect to uncertainty? Now, after some initial investigation, it turns out that it's actually possible. Well, here's a simple illustration. So if you consider this so-called the middle problem, it's actually a simplified version of the middle problem. Uh, it's a two-dimensional problem, you have x and y, and it's non-linear. So here I have two control u1, u2. And what I want is that I want to design this control U1, U2 so that I'm going to tag my system from this initial condition to the origin. So this, uh, that's my control objective. Now in this con control system, this P is a parameter, it's a constant, but it's an unknown constant. I suppose I know that this P lies in this range from 8 to 12, but I don't know what's exactly value of this P. So this P basically represents some uncertainty in my uh, model. Now, to design a control in an open control framework, <coughs> uh, I talk, or I went, uh, kind of engineer type of solution is that because I don't know this P, but I do know this range. Okay. So how about I just set P to be its nominal value or to be at its mean value. Okay. For example, here, I can set P to be, say, 10. Okay. It's just middle, in the middle between 8 and 12. And I'm going to design my control with respect to that nominal parameter value okay. of my uncertainty. Now, if you do that, you can design open control of this, uh, which is shown here, u1, u2, is a function of time. Now, for this open control, because I designed this open control with respect to nominal value of p, which is 10. So that means if p happened to be this value 10, then the trajectory will basically go from this initial point to the origin, to the design origin. But if this p take any different values other than 10, the trajectory will be different. So in, in this part, I basically uh, show a mechanical simulation by varying this P from this range, from A to 12. Then I can generate a bunch of trajectory, which is, with a, is an ensemble trajectory. So you can see that this ensemble trajectory, most of them basically will miss this target, which is already 0, 0, which is not surprising because when I design my control, I pretend that this P is 10. But in reality, this P can be any value between A and 10. Uh, A and 12. So this kind of uh, design of open control without explicit consideration of uncertainty. Now here, what I'm showing is a different control design. The method to design this control, I'm going to present in a few minutes. So what you can see is this control signal is very different to this one. And when I design this control signal, I do have explicit consideration of this uncertain parameter P. And if I fade this control signal into this dynamic system, into this dynamic system, and still I'm going to do Mulcaro, I'm going to sample this P from this range and generate a lot of sample trajectory. Now what you see that this ensemble trajectory, they will all end at this target point, zero, zero. So in other words, these two control signals, they're both open loop, but this one is not robust with respect to uncertainty P. This one is robust. And the reason is that when I design this control, U, when I design this open loop control, I actually explicitly consider this uncertain value, uncertainty p. So next, I'm going to present to you how we design this uh, this control within open control framework. Well, our, uh, the, the best idea is actually quite straightforward, uh, based on some assumptions, key assumptions. The key assumption is this: I'm going to assume that all the uncertainty, the uncertainty can come from say unmodeled dynamics or unknown parameters or uncertain initial condition, but I'm going to assume that all this uncertainty can be grouped into just one vector signal. 
Okay. And this theta can be high dimension. So this theta basically represents all possible uncertainty, source of uncertainty. And I assume that I do know the PDF probability distribution of this theta, which is, which is it's fine. This is my basic assumption. Now, this theta can actually represent many different types of uncertainty in the control system. Well, for instance, here, you can see that this theta can represent unknown parameters in your system. For instance, as a middle problem I just presented for your slides. And this theta can also represent uncertain initial condition. And why you may have an uncertain neutral condition? Well, in control system, in your measure state, you need to have a sensor. And all sensors will have some noise, or have some measurement error. So that basically means you, when you take a sense of measurement, you're not going to get precise value of your state variable x. So instead, you will only know kind of distribution of that state variable. And it, uh, it's straightforward to show that if you have initial condition uncertainty or parameters uncertainty in your system, these two types of uncertainty are basically equivalent. So that's why I can basically group all these two different uh, these two different types of uncertainty into just one parameter state. Now, if you look at this uh, system here, if I fix value of theta, remember theta is unknown. Okay. It has some distribution. But if I fix a particular value of theta, I just got a standard and controlled dynamic system. But since theta is unknown, and theta can take different values, as you vary the value of theta, you basically got an ensemble trajectory. You got a trajectory Q. So each different value of theta will generate a different state trajectory. So now in open control framework, what we try to do is we try to optimize, we try to design control to optimize with respect to what we know about uncertainty. Now there are different type of uncertainty, there are known unknowns, there are unknown unknowns. Right? So here we have no unknowns in the sense that, yes, this theta is unknown, but I do assume that I know the distribution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to optimize with respect to this distribution. This is knowledge I know. Now, in order to do that, a simple approach is that I can simply change my cost function to be optimized into an expectation. Remember, this phi here is a PDF, so this term here is nothing but a PDF. And here, if you take out this theta, suppose you remove theta and you remove this outside integration, then you got the standard cost function that I presented in the very first slide. So the only difference between that cost function and this one is this unknown parameter theta. Or in other words, I simply change that cost, standard cost function standard cost function into this expectation. Right. So that's the only change. So basic idea is that, uh, and also noting that this control is still open loop. It's not closed loop. Control does not depend on uncertainty or depend on this parameter theta. So it's open loop. Open loop control. So essentially, I try to design open loop control that control a special of possible systems. Here, special basically means this theta will vary. Right? Uh, vary according to this distribution. So the spectrum of possible system trajectories. That will uh, optimize the expected performance. In other words, I'm going to optimize this expectation. Now in summarize, that open control problem can be modeled into this generalized uncertain open control problem. Well, this theta again represents uncertainty, and this phi is a distribution of that theta. And the theta can appear in your dynamic system as an unknown parameter, or it can appear in your initial condition or final condition to represent some uncertainty in the sense of measurement. Now, this problem is basically a generalization of the standard nonlinear open control problem. So if you take out, if you fix the value of theta to be any given particular value, you got a standard open control problem. So from that perspective, it's a generalization of the standard open control problem into this uncertainty case. Now, this is certainly a non-standard open control problem. And for this open control problem, if you have a non-linear dynamics and you have constraint, you have to use numerical approach. So in the past several years, we basically focused on this problem, how to design efficient computational method to solve this type of open control problem. Now, most of the current uh, algorithms can be, can be basically framed into this uh, scheme. So, this computational framework including, uh, includes three steps. The first step is the discretization of the parameter space. Okay. So this theta is a high, uh, is a high, uh, is my uncertain parameter and lives in some high-dimensional space. Say this capital theta. 
So the, the first step, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample this unknown parameter. So although I don't know this uncertain parameter or unknown parameter theta, but I do know its distribution. So that, therefore, based on distribution, I can better discretize this parameter space theta to generate samples. So here, this big M means number of samples. So this theta M, theta M is basically the, the sampled uh, unknown, unknown parameter. Now, how to sample it? There are different ways. You can do quadrature type of sampling or sigma point, or just no type of sampling. Now, for each sample per unknown parameter theta, so now once you, once you sample an unknown parameter, this theta m becomes a fixed value. So, therefore, you're going to generate better ensemble trajectory. Well, this big m represents the number of samples you choose. And with this sample trajectories, now I can approximate this expectation by this finite sum. Uh, based on only sample trajectory and sample parameters. Well, this alpha is a numeric integration weight, depending on what type of uh, visualization scheme you choose. For instance, if you choose Monte Carlo, that this alpha is simply one over number of samples. If you, if you choose quarter, then you're going to use different type of weights. So this is nothing but visualization in the parameter space. The key thing is that once you do this discretization, once you discretize your original optimal true problem with uncertainty, only in the uncertainty space, if you only discretize uncertainty uh, space, you're going to generate this problem. This looks very uh, messy, and it, actually it is a quite messy problem. But the key thing is that this is nothing but a standard optimal control problem. It has a lot of constraints, it has phenomenal dynamics. But it's standard optimal control problem. Because in this problem, all the unknown parameters theta are assigned to a particular value, which is nothing but this sample value theta m. And as I mentioned in the very first uh, slide, for a standard optimal control problem without uncertainty, nowadays we do have very efficient numeric algorithms that can be used to solve these type of problems. So for this problem, because it's a standard optimal control problem, I can apply existing numeric tools to solve it and generate a solution. For example, if you want to use so-called direct type of method, you can basically do, uh, you can further discretize this optimal control problem in time to man, then you can get the finite dimensional optimization. Then you can solve the finite dimensional optimization to get the control. So this is the basic idea of that computational scheme. Basically, uh, most of the existing uh, computational schemes for solving these type of problems. Of course, there are also some very interesting, I'm kind of applying the mathematicians, I'm also interested about some the theoretical part of the uh, of the problem. So, uh, subject to that uh, uh, numeric algorithm, there's some interesting theoretical issues that need to be addressed. For instance, convergence and consistency. And consistency. So, in the past several years, we have been working on this area and we developed some uh, convergence result and consistent result. Uh, reference are given here. The two key references are these two: uh, a regular paper in North America and a paper in Saikon. This should basically summarize all the theoretical results related to this problem. So next, I'm going to uh, uh, present you an application of that uh, uncertain optimal control problem in a topic, uh, your area called optimal search. Well, optimal search is actually a classical problem that started in operational research. Uh, the optimal search problem, essentially what we try to do is try to detect our own target. And, uh, so how to detect on the target? Here we consider to use mobile sensors. So basically, you're going to set, we are going to set up some online vehicles, and this vehicle will equip some sensors, and we try to detect our on the target. Okay. And control, uh, you can have different type of control objective. For instance, you can try to maximize information gain. That's basically a coverage type of problem. Or you can try to maximize probability of detecting target. Now, for home search problem, it's actually it has been started for many, many years. In by many operational research area. Now, for open search problem, if on mathematical model, it you basically need three key components. The first component is a target model that you need a searcher model, and they need a, a function to measure the performance criteria. For the target model, uh, the different way to model this unknown target. For instance, you can try to model your unknown target as a diffusion process, and here. I'm going to present a rather simple approach to model this unknown target as a so-called conditional deterministic motion. If I denote my target, which is unknown, as using this symbol y, and since here we consider a moving target, so this, un this unknown target y will be a function of time, of course. And because it's unknown target, so I'm going to assume that this y also depends on an unknown parameter theta. 
So this theta is unknown. The theta best represent all uncertainty about this target, unknown target. And we do assume that the distribution of theta is given. So I know what's the probability distribution of theta. So what I show here is an example of such so-called conditional deterministic motion. So here, <coughs> I assume that my target, unknown target, will start from this vertical line, but with an unknown initial position. And initial position is subject to, I think here, some, uh, a beta distribution. So each line here represents one possible trajectory of that unknown target. So, and here I have just one target. This is not like a solid target, just one target, but possible trajectory of that one target. And the color scheme represents the probability. For instance, this method shows that most likely my unknown target will be in this area. Now, the second key component of the search problem is the searcher model. And for searcher models, since here we consider a mobile searcher, so I'm going to have a vehicle dynamics, which is nothing but a control difference equation. And I need a model, need a model to measure the sensor performance. Now, here we use a concept called instantaneous rate of detection, which is a function of R. Now, this instantaneous rate of detection basically depends on two things. One is the searcher state x, and y is the target state y. So given the x and y, this function r basically quantify what's the rate of detection. Explicit form of this r, well, this detected rate, will depend on the sensor. If you use radar, or if you use vision, if you have different type of sensor, you will get different type of this function r. Now with this intensive rate, I can basically write down the probability of detection. The probability of detection of detect a target within a time horizon, delta t, is basically given by this great function r times this time horizon. Now, with this probability, I can basically write down my performance curve here. For instance, if I want to maximize probability of detecting a target, I can write down the probability of not detecting target to be uh, this format. It's especially a function given by this instantaneous rate of detection, given by the function r. And if I try to minimize this probability of not detecting a target, I basically try to maximize probability of detection. And if you group these three p together, this is a mathematic model of this optimal search problem. So you're going to try to find your searcher trajectory x and of course searcher control u so that this searcher uh, state will satisfy some boundary conditions, some constraint. And you're going to minimize the probability of not detecting the target. So here this y is my unknown target. And again, theta represents all the uncertainty in the target. And this phi represents the PDF probability distribution of the target. Now, if you look at this problem, it's basically a special case of that uncertain optimal control problem that I presented before. So, therefore, I can apply this numeric algorithm to solve this problem. And here there is a here's a simulation example. So, in this, uh, this is for so-called channel search problem. So, in this uh, so-called channel search problem, we consider uh, to design a trajectory of four searchers, which are basically represented by this uh, uh, the green dot here. And the purpose of this searcher is to detect an unknown target. And here we assume that the unknown target moving with a constant velocity from right to left. So I know that I have a target moving from here to here. But the starting position of that target is unknown. And assume that the starting position is uniformly distributed in this channel, in the rectangular area. And uh, for this problem, we basically model the problem using the framework I just presented. Using, uh, so using this framework to, to model this problem, and we solve the problem using the numeric scheme that I introduced briefly in the previous slides. The solution is basically given in this movie. Well, here the color scheme basically represents the uh, probability uh, of an uh, undetected target existing in a given location. So initially, you can see that a lot of area basically uh, in red, and red basically means a high probability of an uh, undetected target undetected in this area. 
class, this uh, oh, uh, this searcher who we sorry, I don't know how to play it again, but well, uh, as this searcher moving through this channel, eventually you're going to see that most of the area will change to this uh, blue color, which basically means the probability of existing an undetected target in that area become very, very low. It diminishes because of the motion of the searcher. Now, we solve this problem basically using that numeric scheme that I presented before. But that numeric scheme has a, a major limitation. The limitation is actually curse of dimensionality. Now that method can only be applied to a problem with small dimension of uncertainty. So you have, say, uncertain parameter theta, and suppose that theta lives in one dimension, two dimension, or maybe three dimension, then it's probably okay to do that event scheme to solve it. But if you have a large source of uncertainty, if that unknown, unknown parameter lives in high dimensional place, you have four sources of uncertainty, five different sources of uncertainty, then using that numeric scheme becomes very hard. Why? Because you have to generate a lot of samples. You have unknown parameter theta, which lives in R4, R5, and you have to represent it. You need to generate like tens of thousands or maybe millions of samples to represent that unknown vector in high dimension. So in the last couple, couple of years, we try to develop a more scalable and data-driven computational scheme so that I can push the limit of dimensionality of unknown uh, parameters. And we designed so, uh, uh, our version uh, actually for the last uh, few months. And this algorithm turns out to be quite success successful in solving relatively high dimensional problems. And we can actually push the dimension to somewhere around 10, 12, or maybe 20. Uh, this algorithm is based on uh, three key things. The first is market shooting computational scheme. Well, market shooting is actually a quite standard approach for in, in uh, uh, computation on control. The basic idea we use is that we're going to divide time horizon into shooting segment, and within each shooting segment, I'm going to group uh, discrete time by control, continuous control, using piecewise constant. So that's the case in piecewise constant approximation of control. I'm going to skip uh, some technical details because it's uh, actually quite standard thing in uh, computation on control. Now, using that uh, market shooting discretization scheme and with control being represented by piecewise constant, I can actually uh, convert our discrete highs by original infinite dimensional of control problem into a finite dimensional opposition problem. And here in that finite dimensional opposition problem, I basically represent my continuous dynamics by this discrete dynamics. And you can get this discrete dy dy dynamics using any your favorite numeric integrator. You can use Euler or RK4 to represent, uh, to discrete your continuous dynamics. Now, the second key component of this scale of our uh, data algorithm that we, we designed is an efficient graded computation. And it turns out that in almost all op opposition problems, or including all control problems, most of the computation is on the graded part. And it's very typical that graded computation may, if you do a profiling, it's very typical that graded may, a computation may take maybe 80% of the overall computation. So how to get the effect, make the gradient part more uh, computationally efficient is one of the key to design a uh, scalable uh, algorithm for this type of high dimensional control problem. And here we, we, we use a, a, actually quite a simple idea by integrating tensor flow with IPR, which is a constraint, an industry standard uh, constraint optimization solver. So essentially what we do is I'm going to use IPR as my optimizer to, op to solve the optimization problem. But I'm going to use TensorFlow to compute gradient for IPR. Now, why use TensorFlow? TensorFlow, well, I guess all of you know that TensorFlow is basically a tool for training neural network, in neural network. And we use TensorFlow because we realize that there's actually structure identity between neural network and this discrete dynamics that I just presented for you the slide. And to, this, to see that the identity, Let's consider this diagram I'm showing here. And just imagine like a very simple Euler discretization to a dynamic system. Okay. Now, if I give you an initial state T0 and it give you initial control, remember in my discretization scheme, I use a piecewise constant control. So if I give you this two, you're going to generate the state variable at the next time using T1. And you can repeat this process. You basically propagate your control from T0 all the way to Tn. Then you can, you're going to generate a final state. 
So this passage is nothing but a representation of the discrete dynamics going from initial clock T0 all the way to final clock. Okay. Now if you look at this structure, and if you interpret this U, this control, as the bias and weight in your neural network, and you interpret this plot, which is numeric integrator, as the activation function in neural network. Then this structure is identical to neural network. It's nothing but neural network. It just needs a little bit different interpretation. So therefore, I can use all the great tools that already be integrated TensorFlow, for instance, computational graph, parallelization, the vectorization, and backpropagation to compute really. Okay. So this is basically the motivation of, of incorporating these two tools together for grading uh, computation. And also, based on this diagram, we uh, see that all these blocks, they're actually identical. All in neural network language, those activation functions for different levels are basically identical. Okay. Now, using this uh, property, we can further reduce memory requirement. If you directly code this structure into a, a tensor flow, especially for long horizon problems, high dimensional problems, then it will take some time because tensor flow to lay out a big computational graph okay, to represent this thing. And if you, if you utilize the structure problem and realize that all those problems are identical, we can actually re significantly reduce memory requirement and use in order to model these discrete dynamics by uh, incorporating this technique called common subtraction emulation. This essential idea is just re uh, uh, tech, uh, get, get rid of the redundancy when you try to code that uh, uh, discrete dynamics into your, into your computer system. Now, as an illustration for one of the problem, example problems that we, we solved, well, without this technical uh, CSE common self-expression emulation, the memory requirement is 40 gigabytes, and with this the technical, the memory requirement reduced to just one gigabyte. So it's a 40 times reduction. Now, this memory reduction turns out to be very, very essential for solving high dimensional problems. So for solving high dimensional problems, you need to generate a lot of sample data. And those sample data need a lot of storage in the memory to store them, and, you to, uh, and it also increases computational time significantly. So if I can reduce the memory requirement, I can actually increase the efficiency by several order of magnitude. And next, I will just present uh, maybe I have three examples, but because of time limit, I probably just present two of them. Uh, the first one is very simple. Let's just consider a unicircle. It's a very simple uh, ground vehicle model, unicircle. So x1, x2 represent position, x3 is orientation, and this r is the radius of the wheel. I have two controls. U1 is forward velocity, U2 is turning rate. And here I assume U1 and U2 are both, uh, they're all bounded. And for this problem, I'm going to introduce uncertainty into initial condition. So I assume that initial position is unknown. It's around this zero origin, but with some uh, but uniform distribution in between this low and outbound. I also assume that the, the orientation is also unknown, uniform distributed in this one. I also assume that wheel, the size of the uh, radius of the wheel is unknown. It's, it's in between 1 and 1.5. It's actually quite large uncertainty. Just a toy academic example. Now, for this uncertain problem, uh, we, uh, we designed this stochastic path planning problem. Suppose I want to take this vehicle from, say, origin to this target location, 3 3. And subject to all this uncertainty. Now, using the framework I presented before, I can basically model this path planning problem as an uncertain open control problem with my cost function to be an expectation. This is an expectation because this x1 tf, x2 tf, the position at the final time, they depend on this initial uncertainty. So that's why this is an expectation. Now the second term here basically represents control energy, where this q is a small weight. And the reason I want to include projecting term is that it typically makes opposi regularized opposition problem. Now for this problem, if as an engineering way, or as, another, as a way to create a benchmark comparison. First, we solve the problem without, consider, uh, without consideration of uncertainty by fix this initial condition R to be at their normal value or mean value. For instance, here, although x1, x2, x3, the uniform distributed within this bound, I'm going to assume that these three values are nothing but zero at the mean value. I call that normal value. Now, if you, have, if you fix all the uncertainty at the normal value, 
there's no expectation you can get an n tag out of this expectation because it determines state standard, it determines our control problem. If you solve that problem, I'm going to call that solution. That solution to be normal solution. A normal control is given here, and this normal, again, normal control is designed with without consideration of uncertainty. And if you feed this normal control into a system, into a vehicle, and you probably do more color sampling, you, know, you pick different uh, initial conditions within that given uncertainty range, you generate this trajectory Q. And what you can see is that at the final time, the, the position of the vehicle okay, is actually, it could be quite far away from the target point. Now, as a comparison, we also solve the problem with the explicit consideration of the uncertainty okay, by model that the problem, pass-binding problem, a stochastic pass-binding problem. Then we got this optimal control, which is very different to normal one. So with consideration, with, with explicit consideration of uncertainty, you get quite basically completely different control. Now, if you implement this control to a system, you can also generate this ensemble trajectory. And this ensemble trajectory of the vehicle is actually quite different to this normal one. You basically head for this direction, then you take a sharp turn. The reason you want to take a sharp turn here is because this turns out to be that you can uh, reduce the final spread, reduce this final spread of your vehicle position. Okay. Indeed, by comparing these two, you can see that this one, my find the vehicle is more concentrated around this target at the final time. And why? Simply because when I design my control, when I'm planning this path, I explicitly consider the uncertainty. Now, I'm going to skip this part. Uh, using some theoretical result developed, you can actually more, uh, verify the automatic of that uh, control that, that we designed. The next example, uh, that's, that, uh, that YouTube is just a core example, it's only four dimension. Uh, here, we designed this algorithm for high dimensional problems. So next, I'm going to present a high dimensional example problem. It's a fixed width UAV. Okay. Uh, here uh, it's a ten, uh, it's nine-dimensional uh, system. So x, y, z represent position, and this v is velocity, and gamma, theta, the best elevation at any angle. And t is a thrust, and alpha mu, the best uh, angle of tag and back of angle. So it's a ten-dimensional problem. Now within this dynamics, there are two terms d, m is l, drag and uh, and lift. Okay. And here we model drag and lift in this form. And this drag and lift force they include some parameters. They basically they include basically the four parameters, CX0, CXA, CZ0, CZA. Now these four parameters, although they're constant, they basically define the lift and drag force. Although they're constant, but they're very hard to measure. Especially for a cheap fixed uh, small size uh, fixed wing UAV. You're typically you're not going to get those parameters from manufacturing. And if you try to measure it, well this uh, this, this memory will always associate with large uncertainty. So what we're trying to do is try to solve a pathfinding problem and subject to large uncertainty in the system model, system parameters, as well as in the um, uh, initial conditions. So here, the pathfinding problem is basically defined in a very similar way to the UGV problem. So we want to take this uh, UAV from some initial position to a target located here, and subject to this uh, all uncertainty in my uh, state variable, together with uncertainty in that full parameter that define lift and drag. Okay. So overall, it's a ten-dimensional uh, problem. I have ten-dimensional uncertainty, and I have some control constraint. So trust is bounded, and the, these two control uh, also are bounded, and I have, uh, have some constraint on the on the, the vehicle parts, on the parts of the airplane. So uh, the mean path should be sat should satisfy as it is lower bound and upper bound. Now this problem again we solve uh, we model this problem using that uncertain optimal control problem uh, uh, optimal framework and we solve it using the framework that uh, presented. And here's a, a solution. It's a comparison be between this nominal and optimal. Nominal again just assume that all uncertainty are fixed at a nominal value. Then you solve the resulting determine the optimal control problem. You can see that for the normal control, if you fit the normal control into the system, you actually got this wide behavior of your UAV. You certainly don't want to use that control in the system. Now why, uh, but for this optimal control, which is given here, okay. although the, 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 the vehicle is still uh, spreading out uh, around the target, but the trajectory is much more concentrated compared to this uh, normal. 
So in other words, this control is much more robust compared to the normal control. And it's robust with respect to both under parameters and the uh, initial conditions, initial dependent on the I think I have just a few minutes. Let me just <laughs> present a very, I think a kind of cool example, but only very briefly. Now this is an example about uh, about uh, multi-agent motion planning. Uh, here we consider three type of heterogeneous agent. Uh, the first type, first agent called high value unit. A high value unit is better stationary or moving unit and need to be protected. And second type of uh, agent is uh, we call it attacker. Now uh, you can have multiple attackers. Now these attackers they basically have deterministic dynamics, but with some uncertainty. Uh, because typically we don't have precise information about the attack attacker. So, and uncertainty about the attacker can come from uncertain uh, position of the attacker or uncertain velocity, so those type of things. But it has a deterministic dynamics. And we assume that this attacker will basically try to destroy the high value unit. Okay. And this uh, attacker will not define themselves. So it's in many three uh, languages called the uh, Kamisaga type of attacker. So it's a single minded try to destroy a high value unit but not protecting themselves. The third type of agent is called defender. It's about a swarm of common vehicle that will try to shoot down this uh, attacker so that it can protect a high value unit. So it's kind of like a game type of set setup. So what we try to do is we try to plan the motion of the defender. Okay, this is, defender is something we can control. I'm going to control my defender so that I can maximize the probability of survival of high value unit. Or you will minimize the probability that high value unit be destroyed. Because high value unit is something I'm trying to try to uh, protect. So here I'm going to skip some of the technical details in the modeling part. If you're interested, you can uh, take a look at this reference that published last year in never recent logistic. So basically by that problem that I presented can be mathematically modeled into this uncertain optimal control parameters. Okay. Uh, with some uncertain state that represent basic probability of survival of the attacker and probability of survival of high value unit. Again, technical details, if you're interested, you can look at this paper. The uh, key thing is that that problem, that practical problem can be modeled into this uncertain optimal control problem. But kind of high dimension. And for this problem, uh, in a we can solve it by using the better uh, computational method we presented. And here is a simulation result for one of the scenario. And in this simulation scenario, uh, we consider one stationary high value unit, see it here, and we can consider 100 attacker. So I've got a lot of uh, attacker. And attacker basically a circle uh, around this high value unit. High value is in the center, attacker basically around this uh, circle. Now I assume that I don't have precise information of the What I know is that in, inside this, each piece, there is, a, there is one attacker, and overall, I have 100 attackers. And the exact location of that attacker can be anywhere inside this disk, that disk. So that represents the uncertainty. And we can see that if, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, see this, because I use uh, uh, PowerPoint in Mac, and now when I transfer to Windows side, some some form of that mess up. But this, uh, for you guys, I guess you probably are very familiar with this. It doesn't have a double vehicle. So the defender assumes that it has a double vehicle with constant uh, velocity. And here's a simulation setup. Uh, for each uh, attacker, well, I have 100 attacker, I've finished attacker, I'm going to discretize these uncertain parameters using eight samples. And the dynamics of attacker uh, is discretized in RK4 using our uh, four sort of uh, uh, kata. And we implement that argument that I presented before in, uh, uh, in parallel fashion so that I can basically uh, propagate each sample trajectory forward in parallel, uh, in parallel fashion. And this parallelization is done on our GPU so can, uh, to speed up the, the computation. And here's the simulation result. Uh, in this movie, this red cross here is basically the location of high value unit, and it's a stationary high value unit. And these blue dots here are my defenders. And here I think I have a way with uh, six defenders. And this red star represents attacker. So I have basically 100 attackers. Although to, uh, um, and the size of this red star 
is proportional to the probability of survival of the attack. So as I show the movie, this red star will better shrink. That basically means the probability of that attacker still survival is diminished because of these defenders. Yeah, here I have actually seven. So as you can see that this attacker basically initially moving toward this high value unit because they want to destroy high value unit. And the defenders Initially, the circle around high value unit, as the attacker approaching to high value unit, the defender basically fans out. So that they can, they can defend the, the high value unit by destroying those attackers. And you can see that the size of this red star gradually decreases. That, be, that basically means the probability of survival of attacker diminishes with respect to time because of the action of the defender. As the time moves forward, eventually all the attacker basically diminish. Okay. So it basically means I can actually successfully defend high value. And in another simulation, which is not, uh, 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 which I don't have the movie in, the, uh, in, my, in my laptop, but uh, if you reduce the number of defenders, so here I show seven defenders. If you reduce the number of defenders, what you will see that, well, in the end, when, uh, as time advances, there will still be some attacker existing. Uh, which, with, uh, in other words, with less number of defender, you will not be able to successfully defend the highway unit. The highway unit will eventually be destroyed. And it turns out that seven is the minimum number that you can you will need in this uh, scenario. In this scenario. And last one, last and least, uh, thank you for my first thank you for your attention. And here I want to thank for my collaborators and also funding agencies. And this research is supported by Office Naval Research and uh, And with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. How to use the mathematics tool to solve the real problem? So some questions and some comments. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so because you are using this uh, probability kind of probability of presentation, then your problem uh, becomes a stochastic optimal control problem. Is that right? Uh, well, actually, no. <laughs> there's, there's some difference. I tell you why to realize the difference. Well. The problem we have here is the so here the uncertainty is a constant grand uncertainty. This is the same. And this dynamic system here, this dynamic system is not stochastic. It's not a stochastic process. It's still a deterministic dynamic system. But the value by the stochastic. But it has some stochastic uh, um, feature, or some stochastic mm -hmm. test represented by this theta. But if you fix any particular value of theta, then you got a complete deterministic motion and a complete no motion. Okay, uh, my second question is, how do you determine the distribution function? Because it's not that easy. It's not easy to know the distribution function. No. Sorry, can you? How do you determine the distribution function for the uncertainties? You mean determine? Uh, to know the distribution function. You need to know the distribution function. Distribution function? Distribution function. You mentioned that you use the distribution function, that right? For the probabilistic uncertainties. Solution. I said it. Oh, I said it. Oh, for also you mean uh, a distribution? Yeah, 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 yeah distribution. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is one of the basic assumptions. Yeah. And this is actually a key assumption. And uh, yeah, how, that, how you do that assumption? Yeah, this is a very good question. And well, uh, it's kind of depend on application. Now, in the worst case scenario, uh, suppose I actually have no information about this uncertainty, I can better provide uh, as a uniform distribution. Okay, for instance, suppose I say I have an unknown parameter in my system, which I don't know. But typically, you, you do know the range. If, if, if this parameter represents some physical, has some physical meaning, then at least we know what's the low uh, bound, up bound. 
And suppose I don't have any actual information beyond this law and up on, I will simply assign a uniform distribution. And if you do have some actual information, suppose I have a pretty good sensor to measure it, and I know that the sensor error kind of subject to Gaussian distribution, then I'm going to assign all Gaussian distribution to that. I just want to do a comment. Uh, you mentioned that there are two methods to solve the nonlinear optimal control problem. There is still another method, like ADP, approximate dynamic program. Oh, the ADP. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And there is another one developed at the University of California, by the way, the inverse optimal control. Uh, sorry. In inverse. Optimal control. Oh, you work in Versa? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Optimal control yeah. developed at Santa Barbara. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, in, Ver in Versa, optimal control is a little bit different in the sense that typically in the first few cases where you design control, that, that control yeah, yeah. It turns out to be optimal with respect yeah, yeah. to certain cost function. Right? But uh, here, what I present here is that you fix your cost function and try to design uh, uh, yeah, the feedback control. You see that? that? For, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And for the dynamic uh, process dynamic programming, I think uh, somehow you can you can crack, uh, categorize that into agent equation type of uh, yeah. method. Okay. It's uh, highly related to agent. Yeah. Yeah. What we uh, what we must understand by uncertain systems. Sorry. Uh, uh, why uh, we must understand by uncertain systems. Understand. I mean, uh, what is an what, uh, what is an uncertain system? What is an uncertain system? Yeah. Oh, yeah. well, a, 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 a system from which initial conditions are unknown, are a model a model of dynamics. That's that's a great question. Uh, so from a uh, control yeah. viewpoint, well, the many different sorts of uncertainty. Uh, you can have um, let's say unknown parameter, uncertain parameters in the system. You can have unknown uh, initial condition possibly uh, due to, or due to sense of environment uh, error. Right. And you can have unmodeled dynamics because most of the mathematic model comes from simplification of the real system. Mm -hmm. So there must be some unmodeled dynamic disturbing. Right. And you can also have some external disturbance. You can have many different variety sorts of uncertainty. But in this work, I basically focus on the type of uncertainty that can be represented by this unknown parameter. And this unknown parameter basically capture at least two types of uncertainty. One is unknown parameter in your system model. Okay. Let's say I have a vehicle, suppose I don't know what's a mass, I don't know the inertial uh, precisely, and those parameters can be treated as unknown parameter. A second type of uncertainty can be captured by this unknown parameter is initial condition uncertainty. You can initial condition, you can initial condition uncertainty, it, it's, it's mathematically equivalent to parameter uncertainty in the dynamic system. This is just equivalency. So in this 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 work basically represents at least two types of uncertainty. One is uncertainty in your, in your model. One is uncertainty in the initial condition. And actually, it also represents some uncertainty in things like target. For some applications, mm -hmm. uh, like this optimal search problem, you have per, you can, you don't have one, you, you may you may not have uncertainty in your search of, uh, dynamics in your search of initial condition, but uncertainty can come from that unknown target. Okay. Yeah. That's another possible source also. Well, uh, my uh, question arises from uh, uh, the reason that there are a lot of works uh, that try with uncertain systems that uh, what we must understand so well. I, that is why I raise that the question. Thank you. Yeah. The disturbance does not affect the optimality of the controller. Uh, you mean just disturbance has? Yes, because you, you design a control, a controller, uh, and if the disturbance is in a simple interval, can affect the optimality of the controller. Does not affect in this case? Uh, well, definitely affect. <laughs> That's for sure. So basically, uh, I guess you're talking about kind of external disturbance. So you have a certain different yeah, it's uh, it's how to affect your controller. Yeah, well, <laughs> has a, let me just. Let me just this, this <laughs> Now, oh, maybe the next one. 
Now, if you have this term here, that this term will actually push your, uh, state, uh, the state trajectory away from your planned trajectory. Okay. So suppose I say, I, I, I design a control. Okay. Suppose there's no disturbance. That control will try my state x to, let's say, somewhere at x equal to 3. But if you have disturbance, that disturbance might push your state trajectory x away from the target location x equal to 3. Now in that case, typically what you can do is you can try to use this type of feedback mechanism to regenerate a new control. The moment your disturbance that put, disturbance push your, uh, your trajectory away, you take another new measurement, so you know where the new uh, state uh, where, where the state variable is at a new uh, position. Then you generate a new control thing, open control. Then you fade out, fade into the system. So what is next about your your work? Because uh, the problem that you uh, give us as uh, examples are very interesting. Uh, are well, uh, there are multiple uh, directions. One is that here we insist we go here we use this this kind of initial phase of research. So here we use open loop control trying to make an uncertainty. One of the natural question is still consider uncertain on control problem. Can it, uh, does that exist a closed loop feedback control? Similar to my edge of equation. Mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that question is actually highly related to a topic called optimal transport, which happens to be a quite uh, uh, hot topic <laughs> in control in the, uh, in the past several years. Uh, actually, I think last year, maybe two years ago, the best paper award in actual transaction on automatic control was given to a paper that on open transport. So in open transport, essentially what you do is that you try to find feedback control to manipulate the distribution. So I have my initial distribution, let's say it's a Gaussian whatever. Mm -hmm. Then I try to design a feedback control so that my final distribution is whatever the target distribution. That's kind of like a very brief uh, explanation of what is open transport. It's, it, it's actually related to this problem. But here we kind of, we use the uh, open loop, and we don't care about final distribution. Instead of, uh, instead of I just care about the, uh, some statistic properties about the final distribution, like what's the, uh, what's the mean, what's the variance, those things. But the natural question is, is it possible to design a feedback control to manipulate the distribution of uncertainty? That's, yeah, that's uh, it's quite a hard problem, I think. <laughs> And also, it still works to try to develop a lot. Just along this line, still works to try to develop more efficient numeric algorithms. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that ha that can be done by integrating uh, some numeric algorithms with the modern computational tool and the computational hardware. In, by computational tool, I mean software like TensorFlow, PyTorch, those things. And hardware, I mean GPU and market call CPU and those type of hardware computation. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you.